Someone once asked Nicolas Cage if he considered his acting over the top, and an agitated Cage responded, you show me where the top is and I'll let you know whether I'm over it or not, all right? I design where the top is. That may sound absurd, but Nicolas Cage just offered a profound insight into how he builds his performances. They are designed. His exaggerated eyebrows, his underwear-clad screams of pain, his insane reciting of the alphabet aren't necessarily improvised moments of spontaneous insanity. Instead, they're meticulously designed and honed performances. I lost my hand! I lost my bride! By the late 80s, Cage was getting bored with the naturalistic performances that define most Hollywood movies. He yearned to experiment, and thanks to a fortuitous set of circumstances and a director that encouraged him to push his performance to the absolute limit, Nicolas Cage was able to take the character of Peter Lowe and turn him into an expressionistic performance that would influence his career for the next four decades and eventually become the stuff of some legendary memes. Am I getting through to you? Over! So, get ready to buy a cheap pair of fangs and reschedule with your therapist because we're going to examine how Vampire's Kiss gave birth to the Nicolas Cage meme machine. Before we get to Nick chewing the scenery with his imaginary therapist in downtown Manhattan, we need to talk about how some risky creative decisions and some onset tension led to his role in Vampire's Kiss. By the mid 80s, Cage was starting to make a name for himself. After the young Coppola got teased on the set of Fast Times at Ridgemont High, he decided to change his name. People would not stop saying things like, I love the smell of Nicholas in the morning because of Apocalypse Now and Robert Duvall saying, I love the smell of napalm in the morning and it made it hard to work and I decided, I don't need this. Anyway, fast forward a couple of years and a couple of roles and Cage finds himself collaborating with Matthew Modine on Birdie a Vietnam War film about two high school friends that find each other in a hospital after they both suffer injuries from the war. You talked! It's really you! I can't believe they say something else! While Cage liked the film itself, he was not a particular fan of his performance saying, it's almost as if I'm embarrassed by it because it's so bare. There's very little choreography or thought behind it. It's just this very stripped, very wounded character. And for me, it's so personal that I feel uncomfortable watching it. Well, sometimes you're so full of shit. In the same interview, Cage was asked if Brody led him to experiment with more impressionistic performances. Somewhat. I just felt my own naturalistic style has reached a dead end and I was getting bored with it. You know, I go to a museum and I see a Picasso and I think, you know, why is it that he can get away with uh, drawing his wife with spikes coming out of her head or, or having her mouth touch the floor? I envy him. I said, well, why can't I do that? You listen to me. You're Nick. Cage. Two movies later, on Peggy Sue Got Married, Cage would take a swing at a more expressionistic performance, and in the process, he would piss off most of the cast, almost get fired, and put him at odds with the film's producer, Ray Stark. However, his uncle, the film's director, Francis Ford Coppola, stepped in to save his nephew's hide. Cage made a ton of strange creative decisions about his character, Charlie, the high school sweetheart of Peggy Sue, who was obsessed with the B-list Elvis contemporary Fabian and becoming a famous singer in his own right. I told my friends that we would never part. Charlie can really sing! To play this character, Cage decided to use fake teeth and create a vocal performance inspired by Gumby's horse friend, Pokey. Thank you for saving me, but I'm not really lost. Yeah, I guess I can understand that. But please. Don't start crying again. Cage's performance in Peggy Sue Got Married managed to thread a needle where no one except him realized there was a needle that needed to be threaded. This movie may be set in 1960, but it's told from the perspective of a 1985 Peggy Sue who regrets falling in love and marrying a young Charlie. It would have been so easy for Cage to play Charlie as the unambiguously cool guy in a band. Instead, Cage plays him as a kind of a dweeb, where everyone in the 60s is blind to that because they seem to think he's handsome and talented enough to make it as a musician. Let's make love. What? You mean sex? <laughs> Intercourse. 
What time is it? Holy cow. Right. Cage smartly tuned his performance to emphasize Charlie's quirkier elements, elements that Peggy Sue was willfully blind to in 1960, but can see as clear as day after decades of hindsight and regret, which is why when he doesn't get a record deal in the film, his monologue hits so hard. I've got the hair, I've got the teeth, I've got the eyes. I'm the lead singer, I'm the man. Why are you arguing with me? It's over, Charlie. I don't want to hurt you. In a strange turn of events, it worked and garnered rave reviews, even from Siskel and Ebert. That was Nicolas Cage as her boyfriend, and I can't say enough about his performance. He's just not a macho guy. He's a guy who's all confused, an adolescent, just the way all adolescents are. After a few banger roles in Raising Arizona and Moonstruck, Cage seemed like he could do no wrong and was ready to gamble on a bizarre script about a Manhattan yuppie who may or may not have been bitten by a vampire. God. Vampire's Kiss is truly an odd movie, and while it's a good one, it certainly isn't a great one, and a significant amount of this film's watchability comes from Cage's performance in it. I couldn't think of a more horrible job if I wanted to, and you have to do it. You have to, or I'll fire you, do you understand? In the film, Cage plays Peter Lowe a literary agent living in Manhattan. He's a stereotypical yuppie consuming to excess in the Reagan 80s. Think of him as a proto Patrick Bateman, but instead of having delusions of axe murdering his colleagues, beheading models, and chainsawing prostitutes, Peter thinks he was bitten by a vampire. I knew you could keep our passion a secret. Throughout the film, Peter increasingly harasses a female employee, Alva, to find an old literary contract, which seems to be an impossible task. The goddamn contract is somewhere in the goddamn fucking files! <laughs> By the end of the film, Peter's fully convinced he's turned into a vampire, and his harassment of Alva ultimately turns into sexual assault before he murders another woman in a club by biting her throat. Cage took a real gamble on this role. His management didn't want him to take it. The pay was low, he only made 40 grand on the movie, and thanks to the success of Moonstruck, he also had some serious juice going into it. But Cage was tired of the roles he was being offered and wanted to gamble on an extremely abstract performance. And Robert Bierman, the film's director, allowed him to reach that full Cage potential in a way no director had ever allowed before. The tortures of the damned! One of the film's most memorable moments, while not the most artistic, is that Cage actually ate that cockroach. He didn't even have to do it. The script just called for him to down some raw eggs, Rocky style. But this was his idea. And let's be honest, there's no better way to show a character's tenuous grasp of reality than to have them eat bugs. But unfortunately for Cage, he didn't eat just one cockroach. And the director and I, um we were knocking heads a little bit, so he made me do it twice. But I can tell you it was the most disgusting, <laughs> horrible memory I, I have of any experience on a movie set. Cage brought more distinct and unique choices to this performance than just eating bugs. Well. He used body language inspired by German expressionism films from the 20s like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu, which is also featured in the film. So when you see Peter walking around like Max Schreck, yeah, that's German Expressionism for you. And Peter's absurd accent? I don't really know what you're talking about. Well, Cage actually got that idea from his own father. In some ways it was my father, you know, because he was a professor of comparative literature and he made a decision at some point to speak with distinction. And to me, it always sounded absurd, although now I understand. Cage's realization that Peter's need to be distinguished is one of his core flaws is exactly what a good actor is supposed to do, make creative choices that infuse meaning into his performance. But it takes more than combining a distinguished accent with some body language from the 30s to generate a truly memorable performance. Am I getting through to you, Alva? Cage understands that his body is a canvas, and when you see him flailing around and freaking out, that isn't just the magic of spontaneous improvisation. In some cases, it's meticulously planned, 
This famous freakout where he's reciting the alphabet. You know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, huh? He precisely rehearsed that the night before in his hotel room. That's all you have to do. And it's not just Peter yelling at his therapist that struck meme gold decades after its release. Unfortunately, some of the most fertile meme veins in this film are also the most dehumanizing moments for Alva. It's too, too late. late, too late, too, too late. late, too late, it's too late, Alva. It's all too late, Alva. Come here, come here, Alva. Now, I'm not saying that misogyny is fine as long as you do it in a funny and absurd way. Lo, despite being the protagonist, is not a relatable or empathetic character, and he's not designed to be. But these insane moments of expression cast a macabre spell over the audience that a naturalistic interpretation just wouldn't do. The expressionistic impulses that fueled Cage's performance, like when he raises his eyebrows as he's mock listening to Alva's excuse, or when he chases her around the office, make for a great meme because Cage's exaggerated performances communicate those heightened emotions instantly to a viewer. And as we'd learn through our meme culture decades later, this performance doesn't even need context to communicate its emotion. Every other secretary who's been here has been here longer than you, Alva. Everyone. And even if there was someone here who was here just one day longer than you, I still wouldn't ask that person to partake in such a miserable job as long as you were around. And you have to do it. You have to, or I'll fire you. Do you understand? That almost animal instinctual recognition of Cage's emotions in Vampire's Kiss helped elevate what could have been something insultingly mediocre to a film that stood the test of time and even found a second life on the internet. After Vampire's Kiss, Cage really took those expressionistic lessons to heart, which he reused time and time again in decades worth of meme-making performances. That, that's really what, what it is for me, is, is just uh, having those experiments and then trying to apply them again, almost like a laboratory, using independent cinema and then uh, trying to see if you can apply it to a big blockbuster. So a lot of the work that I discovered in Vampire's Kiss, I then put into Face Off. Even the man himself draws a clear inspirational line from Vampire's Kiss to Face Off. And with John Woo behind the camera, Nick found a willing collaborator to push his unique brand of vigorous performances to blockbuster levels. Scenes like the introduction of Caster Troy, where he masquerades as a pervy priest to set his bomb, and the subsequent showdown where Sean Archer has Troy dead to rights, shamelessly begging for his life to buy some time before a failed last ditch effort to get Archer, are perfect examples of Cage applying his maxim that he designs where the top is. <laughs> And when a director like John Woo gives him character motivations like you're actually playing John Travolta playing you and you're trying to cope with the fact that Caster Troy is hanging around your family and you need to convince these criminals that they need to help you kill their boss. Oh, and by the way, did we mention you're also on drugs? John Woo knew that all he needed to do was say action and let Cage cook. Thought you were dead. I'm not dead. I'm me. Face Off wasn't the end of Nicolas Cage's absurdist performances, it was merely a big budget version of it. As the 2000s rolled in, Cage started to take some lower budget fare like 2006's Wicker Man. While Wicker Man bombed at the box office, it found a second life on YouTube thanks to some best moments videos, which when taken out of context, really allow for the absurdity of Cage's performance to shine through. Step away from the bike. How to get burned? How to get burned? I, how to get burned? How to get burned? No, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! 
Later, the film's director, Neil Labute, in an interview with The Believer, acknowledged the film's struggles with tone, saying, Striking a balance between humor and terror can be tricky at times, but we don't always achieve it. Labute also acknowledged that the bear stuff, which according to him was always meant to be funny, said, It was clear that Nick Cage in a bear suit would be amusing, but we were also aware that he was going to be killed at the end. Wicker Man's director may have struggled with balancing tone, but Warner Herzog, the director of Cage's next bonkers performance, Bad Lieutenant Port of Call, knew exactly what he wanted. And I said to him, Nicholas, you know, there's such a thing like the bliss of evil. Go for it. And he really went for it. So it, it was a very short, a short, intense understanding about something essential. And, and from there on, he, he trusted completely. Cage plays Terence McDonough, the titular New Orleans police lieutenant who's trying to solve the murders of five illegal immigrants from Senegal, all while suffering from a drug addiction that started from an injury he suffered while trying to save a prisoner during Hurricane Katrina. I knew that this was the bad lieutenant port of call New Orleans and therefore I had to have behavior that would be outrageous and be fun to watch in terms of its badness, so to speak, and that people would go to the movie to see that, to see the the train wreck of his personality, if you will. And Cage's performance really amps up the bad behavior, from trying to suffocate an old lady to get some info, to sexually assaulting a woman in front of her boyfriend after he smokes their crack, to doing something as simple as picking up his prescriptions. I'm a lieutenant in the police department. I'm in the middle of a homicide investigation. Can I get my prescription, please? Do you see I'm on the phone? What's that look like? Then why are you acting all crazy for me? This is uh, $23 with my copay, right? First 40, get everybody a drink. He's horrifying and captivating, and for some fleeting moments, looks like he's having a great time. That's one way of looking at it. The other is you get to keep 75% not go to prison for the rest of your life. <laughs> Herzog picked the perfect leading man to embody the bliss of evil mantra because it's Cage's over the top, or should I say, meticulously designed top delivery keeps audiences at the edge of their seat knowing that anything is possible. The burner's not really into message movies. He's more about let's celebrate the bliss of evil. Right. <laughs> I understand as well because that's that's it's that's where the comedy is in the movie. Again, Cage successfully managed to find that balance between abject horror and comedy to deliver a performance where a moment like this is both absurdly funny and disturbingly believable. What the f is that? It's my lucky crack bike. You a crazy mother. You don't have a lucky crack butt? No, I don't have a lucky mother crack butt. Well, then, Donald, you gotta take a hit off of mine. Why I gotta do that? Because it's lucky. After 40 years, Nicolas Cage freakouts are almost a genre onto themselves, and when a director manages to creatively incorporate them into their film, there's always the potential for sparks especially when the film is trying to thread a needle between humor and comedy by using an absurd cage outburst. Okay, baby girl, who sent ya? Who sent ya? Sam, back and forth. In an interview for Mom and Dad, a movie about TV static that brainwashes parents into murdering their children, Cage said this about the premise. The point is, it's, it's funny. Crazy, but it's kind of relevant. He's for sure right about the premise, and that movie works because his performance also goes a long way towards selling it. Especially in this scene where he destroys the pool table. Oh, yeah! You put your right foot in, you take your right foot out, you do the hokey pokey, and you. It all out. Obviously, it's both funny and crazy. It wouldn't be a memorable Nick Cage performance if it wasn't. What makes the scene so relevant, though, is that every parent can relate to the guilty feelings Cage's character has about needing an outlet and some space away from their children. He understands that he's being selfish and that conflict between trying to be a good parent but also needing to indulge in some selfish self-love 
is core to the schlocky premise of the film. Not exactly what I had in mind as a young dude, you know. Bright future, everything in the world to look forward to. I mean, I was gonna grab the world by the balls and squeeze, boy! God damn it, I remember that kid I used to be like, it was four minutes ago. And that guy, in a million years, could never have pictured this tired mother he turned out to be flat on his ass. Selling the schlocky motive of a film was also the driving force behind this famous freakout from Mandy. As Red drinks and mourns the death of his lover Mandy, you can't help but feel his pain. <laughs> of course, this is a top-notch cage delivery of internal anguish, but a big reason why this moment is so memorable is because of Mandy's director, Panos Cosmatos's direction and camera work. You know, we did a lot of wonders and some of my favorite stuff happens in one in, in one shot, you know, because it breathes and it moves. And mm. You have to have confidence to do that, which he has. Doing this shot as a one take makes it feel like you're watching Red go through the seven stages of grief in real time. Well, every stage except acceptance and hope. It definitely ends on a moment of acceptance, but there's no hope for Red. He just accepts that he's going to avenge Mandy's death at all costs. And boy, does he. I'm your god now. Whether Cage realizes it or not, funny, crazy, and kind of relevant no! might just be the three key ingredients to an iconic Nicolas Cage meme. Literally every memeable moment highlighted in this video, from reciting the alphabet, to masquerading as a priest, to smoking crack, to destroying a freshly built pool table can be described as It's, it's funny, it's crazy, but it's kind of relevant. And it's Cage's exaggerated performances that communicate those easily adaptable emotions in an immediately and almost instinctual manner, which is why they've managed to become memes in the first place. If it wasn't for Cage's desire to want to experiment and detach himself from naturalistic performances, we might never have gotten Nicolas Cage to put his crazy stamp on Vampire's Kiss. And without Vampire's Kiss, decades of risky performances and amazing memes might never have come to be. To me, Nicolas Cage memes are kind of like a snakeskin jacket. They are loud, absurd, and only someone with the confidence and talent of Nicolas Cage would be able to pull them off. I'm gonna tell you that this here jacket represents a symbol of my individuality and my belief in personal freedom. About 50,000 times. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. For more Cinefix videos, be sure to check out some of our top 10 lists like our top 10 screenplays or our top 10 movies of 2022. And as always, be sure to subscribe to Cinefix.